Hi everybody, Gerge here. Today I wanted to showcase a quick car design exploration example, how we can take a simple idea and how we can create a compelling package out of it before executing on it in a 3D software or refining it on, on that specific idea. So that's what I'm going to showcase today. Let's create a quick file and go ahead. The first thing I do is that I will go to this live render, which is going to allow me to real-time render the sketches according to the prompt that I write here. I want to create a sleek streamliner EV of some sort with a, with a long tail. So that's what I'm going to prompt for. Let's go for an organic streamliner EV concept vehicle. Side view. The sketch will be on top of two ellipses. I want to create a field ellipse to lay out the wheelbase essentially. So this will be the front wheel, Control C, Control V. I use the move tool to determine the actual wheelbase of the vehicle. Okay, this can be a good wheelbase. And I create a new layer to actually make the silhouette on top of it. And now I'm gonna sketch and I'm gonna just uh, watch how real time is going to interpret it essentially. You can also pop out this window if you wanna have a bigger preview and you can extend it. And I can put it here, for example, and then I can make the sketch here. So this can be a nice setup. Awesome. And now roughly sketching out the idea, we can also play with the sliders to, to see how it's going to react. If I now start lowering on the Join Influence slider here, still using the same prompt, how it's going to transform the sketch. 0% it will do something on its own and I can progressively start forcing it on top of the sketch until I have something that, that is going to be satisfactory essentially. With the Palette Influence, I can set how much I want to make the render realistic or how much I want to render this essentially, I can sort of control the steps here. So I can go from my original sketch to something which is a simple form to something which is fully rendered with its environment. And with the little regeneration preview, I can always generate another interpretation. For example, this can be a cool option that we can uh, go with. But what I also wanted to show is that if I grab the move tool, I can always reproportion the actual silhouette and this way I can evaluate the shape as well a bit more. Maybe I want to stretch it uh, towards a certain direction. And you can hold down shift on the keyboard to, to stretch it unproportionally. So we can go uh, with something that is low and sleek. But we can get into something which is going to be good for us, which is a, a two-seater two streamliner EV of some sort. Cool. Yeah, so this can probably be a good option. I can like add this to the canvas as well. The, the last thing which I would show with the real-time rendering is that if you now will start prompt for something that is uh, super abstract, that can be also a cool approach. So instead of this prompt, I can also say matte gray sculpture. And that way it will create something that is very abstract. And then I can form it with words essentially. And I can also have a little bit of an exploration this way, sort of get a more organi uh, organic approach and, and more abstract approach. Now let's close down the generation preview and I can check out what we created here as the rendering on the canvas. So this is a low quality preview. The first approach would be that now we can go into refine and now I can set it to be maybe at 70% and I can give it a refinement because we have a, a lot of noise around the edges that will not be good for the rendering process. First, we have to like refine them and uh, eliminate those rougher edges. So for example, something like this that now I refined can be good for the actual rendering process. So I can go to render, which will be more detailed than the live render. And now I can give it a go with any of the palettes here. I just uh, use the Viscom general now. Yeah, so this way I could completely render on top of the idea. So that would be one approach to take. But the other approach is that I can also go back to the sketch and I just give it a go with the standard traditional rendering tools too. And I can make a few adjustments here just to make it proportionally tighter a little bit. So here I just control C, control V on the V layer, and then I'll adjust the opacity just like in Photoshop. That's what I'll exactly do here. I increase it, the size of it with the move tool. And essentially I can also just render on top of the sketch. So I will go at like full 100% drawing influence. And in Viscom general, that usually that, that can respect the sketch really nicely in, in the general palette. 
This is a really cool and uh, quirky shape that we got here. I quite like it. So we can also add this one and maybe this one as well. Uh, the green one is slightly more interesting to me. So I'll move forward with that. And here I just make a few fixes with the magic erase tool. For example, I just eliminate this flowing line and we can make a, a few adjustments like that. Just like this one, my goal now is to have a clean rendering. Perhaps I can explore lower drawing influences and see how it will react if I re-render this shape with a bit more freedom. Well, it was worth it because um, this one looks very cool. I can add it. And also this one really captured my attention as well. So I'm going to keep these. I can also effectively combine together layers. If I now have this green one as a top layer, but if I like this like side skirt from the previous one, I can just grab this layer and I can erase this part. It's such an in interesting shape that I right on want to make a quick 3D model out of it and check out how that would look. So I clicked on generate 3D and the smooth option. Now let's check out the 3D model that we could generate out of this image. Okay, so if I bring it here, we can see that from a side view, it would capture it really well, I have to say. And we can play here with the focal length too. As I like rotate it around, the shapes are quite accurate to the actual side view. We just have to basically define maybe some of the rough details or big proportional elements at the side uh, or at the front end and the rear view. So for that purpose, I maybe go to like 20 millimeters at the focal length and I set up a rear view and a front view as well. Control C, Control V. And then I rotate it according to the front as well. And on a new layer, you can just sketch on top of these. This one is going to be a really clean front view. So I'll actually gonna go with this one as the front view. And now I have the original side view, front view, and the rear view of the vehicle as well. So now I like further explore and define the shapes a bit more so I can get a better and more accurate 3D representation with the help of the multi-view feature. It says we have to select two to five images, two to five visible layers for it to make it work. So let's just click on this one and shift click on the third layer here. And this way I can make the multi-view 3D. If you have different views on the same layer, make sure to separate them because that's the only way how multi-view is going to work. So instead of this, we can just select them and one by one copy them on new layers. And I can copy it to a new layer either by Ctrl C, Ctrl V or clicking that button. And now it's on a different layer. And this way we can select them all as separate layers to, to make the actual uh, multi-view 3D out of these. In the meantime, while the 3D is loading, let me show you a super cool tip when it comes to importing sketches into ISCOM. So if you sketch on paper, there is a very quick way to actually import them by clicking on the plus icon, either in the workbench or in the studio. And here is a new feature upload from phone. You can scan this QR code with your phone and that will redirect you to an upload button where you can actually make, make a photograph and it will be automatically uploaded here at the workbench. So in this case, you can just like place it on a different canvas. If it's not in the correct orientation, I can just uh, copy this layer here move it. And then uh, another mandatory step here is that you can click on remove background, which is going to actually clean up all the mess from this image. And this way we can just uh, start the rendering process with the help of it after like maybe eliminating this whole view. And now we got the sketch in so we can start the actual rendering process out of it. The multi-view 3D is ready. And it is very interesting to see how it adhere to all of the views that we got. You can see that the texture has been applied by this view because it's really accurate to it. And then if we rotate towards the side, we can also check back on the side view and how it tried to adhere to that. And we can also see that proportionally, it even kept it quite correct to the original side view. And then as I start rotating towards the rear, here the texture is not going to be perfect since it's going to get it from the front view it's usually going to be the, the first image in the stack which you select. And I had the front view, so it's going to take the textures from it. But we can see that the geometry is still there. So if I go to the rear view and if I compare it, so like proportionally it's the same. The, the actual geometry is going to be uh, taken from this view. 
So here we got the actual indications of the taillights and all the geometries are there. So it's a, a super cool exercise to make the multi-view 3Ds, which will adhere to all of these views so that we can actually rotate around and with full freedom, we can make any of these views. But the actual use case why we did that is that if you want to actually like 3D model this idea, we can now take this 3D model and we can export it, for example, in a GLB format. Now we can just uh, take it out to Blender and create the more accurate 3D geometry on top of it. I actually copy and I put it out at the workbench. Since that now we got the 3D asset. So a 3D model is ready. And we made all these renderings that we can also put out at the workbench view uh, to, to actually see the shape altogether. So I can do that. Duplicate in workbench, duplicate in workbench, and maybe we can show this as the front. Uh, if you would want to have like more color and shape consistency, we can put all these at, um, at the same canvas and then we can make renderings on top of it so that we can get style consistency a bit more. Perhaps I can show it, but all it takes is that we can just uh, remove the background of these images, we can place them all together and we can make renderings. And then this way I can maybe also use the workbench now to re-render them in a more consistent form. And then I can select between different palettes as well, such as product realistic or the newly added palettes like design sketch and car shading as well. And here we can see uh, some of the newly added palettes, such as the car shading, which will focus on like quite clean surfaces in this case. And then we have the design sketch, which will focus on this uh, digital Photoshop design sketching style. We can also explore some of the previous ones like the surface sculpt and then we can always use the viscom general as well these all will be consistent if the views are placed on the same canvas as we can see there are some exceptions but in general it should work pretty well now that we have the 3d assets and the shape themselves we can also enhance the actual storytelling if you want to present this idea before executing on the more accurate 3d models for that we can actually let's maybe take this side view here and Let's place it now into an environmental context. We have a super useful environment reference image, which will keep the design as how it is, just change the environment and the lights reflected on the product. For that, just go under references and you can find environment reference. If you don't have an environment reference image, you can also generate inside Viscom. The live render can be really useful for that. So in this case, uh, I'm thinking we should we should put this either into a city or in a countryside so we can try both. I can say car in a city and live render will do its best to create a scene like this. If you want to get closer to the prompt, you can always go low at the join influence. But in this case, it's going to be perfect for us that it can like roughly proportionally will be adequate to, to this view that we have here. So just add to the canvas. I can lock the window back now and click on the layer you can find add to reference images as an option. After that, we can hide this back and now we can go to render and we can click on the actual very rough image that we just want to use as a reference. And here I say, uh, just to make this a little bit more accurate, we can always go back to the original prompt that we have here. And let's go back to environment once again. This will take a little bit, but you can always duplicate the actual page to do something else. So in this case, we can also like start generating a, um, that this already looks quite nice, but the, the live render will offer for us. So we can also take this as a reference, but now I wanted to say, instead of city, we can say countryside, as this is gonna be a very efficient EV that can also attack the countryside roads as well. So I just add a rough reference like this too. And now I can also give it a go with the environment render. In the meantime, I can just jump back to, to the previous window where it already created the city scene for me. This will be nice. A few things that we can do as well is that we can enhance the image. Sometimes we won't have that much environment details and we might want to boost it. So I can also just 
see what it uh, came up with with the countryside option. Okay, this will be a stellar image here, just like the first, but I will add this one. And here if I zoom in, we can also see that it's quite grainy, it's not bad, but we lack a little bit of realism. So I can also click enhance on this. And after enhancing, we can see like how much photorealistic qualities it can actually add to the image. Now, if you have a cool scene, I will just put it out on the workbench now as a separate entity by just copying it out. I can now animate this scene as well. And I can do many kind of animations, but here if I click on the plus icon, I'll bring in the animate node. Uh, my use case will be that I want personas to interact with it, more of a storytelling approach here. If you connect the animate node to an image, it will automatically start describing a certain movement. So it will do like a gliding smoothly uh, action here, slow tracking shot alongside gliding smoothly. So this can be a nice animation. I can click on animate to create that scene. At the same time, I want to describe an animation such as, so here I'm very sequential in terms of the, the actions that I want to see. I just list them one by one. Guy walks up to the vehicle, opens the door, gets inside, drives away. And I do an animation like this as well. In the meantime, I can also share a few animations and what I found as best practices. So for instance, it can be a cool use case if you just do a turntable rotation scene. What I found it to be useful with turntable rotations is that if you prompt for something like vehicle is rotating around to reveal the front end or the back end of the, of the vehicle. So if you specifically say which is the angle that you want to reveal, it can guide it quite nicely. In this case, it was angled towards the front and it will rotate according to the front. I can also show a different example First one is going to be the personal related one. You can always open up the big viewer by clicking on the full screen option. And here it says, hiker walks up to the vehicle, opens the door, gets inside. So it's the same sequence of prompts. And we can see that it can nicely execute on it if we hold its hand and tell it one by one what to do, basically. This was a basic rolling scene here. Vehicle starts driving forward, fast wheel slip, dirt coming off uh, the ground as it takes off. Getting back to the animation, this is why it's a little bit interesting to make animation out of sketch renderings, because we might not be at the correct proportion. Some things might be a little bit wonky because of that. So for example, in this case, the guy seems a little bit tiny. I also got here another animation. And now the guy is more proportional and I want to stop it here. And now let's copy this video frame. So now we can actually retry this animation here with the same prompt, but now starting from this other reference image where we already have a guy in near the door. So it might be easier this way. So I made some other animations out of these scenes that I laid out here. Essentially, one of them will be the guy walks up to the car, gets inside. And in this case, I just wanted to visualize the persona interacting with the vehicle, showcasing the way how to get into the car. But essentially, we might just want to grab a few screenshots here and then copy it to the uh, to the workbench to just make a storytelling image out of it. The second scene was about just a, a simple car is moving away, just a very simple scene to, to see the vehicle in motion as well in a way. But basically that was it that I made for this and the image that I would use in the deliverables, it's gonna be the guy opening up the door, which can be a, a cool way of putting things into proportion and context and also like visualizing the persona there. So that was the added value I could grab from these animations right now. So these would be the deliverables that we can now take and make the proper 3D model out of it. And then when we have the proper 3D model, we can put it back, put it into context and animate the final one as well. I might do that pretty soon. And um, let me know if you have any questions regarding this workflow. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time.